Anita, thank you very much for that. As promised, we've been joined by two scientists. You mentioned the climate change skeptic, <coughs> Professor Fred Singer, and uh, Professor Bob Watson. He's the chief scientific advisor at the Department of the Environment and therefore not a skeptic. Professor Singer, what is the single biggest reason that makes you think that this whole business of CO2 and global warming isn't true? Uh, we see no evidence in the climate record that the increase in carbon dioxide, which is real, has made any appreciable difference in the climate. Climate change has been going on for millions of years, and it's always been natural. No reason to think that it would suddenly stop in the 20th century. But the climate has been getting warmer overall in the, from the 70s onwards? And we've seen CO2 rising as well. Uh, you can only say that the climate has warmed since the Little Ice Age, which was about 300 years ago, when uh, the Thames used to freeze over every winter. So there has been a general warming. If you look into it in detail, there has been some warming in the 20th century, then some cooling, then some warming again. And for the last uh, decade or so, the climate has not been warming. Okay, in fact, it's been cooling. Professor Watson, what do you say to that? That there's no clear link uh, in temperature variations between the temperatures as measured and the CO2 emissions? First, there's absolutely no doubt we've increased the concentration of carbon dioxide by about 30% since the industrial era. It's a greenhouse gas. Simple physics says if you increase the concentration of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere, the temperature of the Earth should respond and warm. There's also absolutely no doubt in the last 100 years, temperatures have increased. Ground-based data, radio sound, that's balloon data, satellite data. And in the last 50 years, we've looked very carefully at the temperature record and we've looked very carefully at the theoretical models and there's a very good correspondence to what you would predict should have happened to the Earth's climate and what we've absolutely is. So are you saying that overall in the 20th century, the trend of temperatures was rising yes but not by a huge amount correct about 0.75 degrees Celsius over the last 150 years with land areas warming more than the ocean and the high latitudes warming more than the tropical areas professor throughout the 20th century there was a trend of rising temperature yeah we don't dispute that the that carbon dioxide has increased and I do believe that it is a greenhouse gas and it's plausible plausible that there should be a detectable effect but as we analyze the data, we don't see the effect of co increasing carbon dioxide. For example, the models cannot explain why there hasn't been a warming in the last 10 years. Why is it cooling? Why well, carbon dioxide is rising? So well, clearly the there's to, no what's direct What's the answer to that, Professor? A lot of the climate skeptics point to the, a peak of temperature in 1998. Yeah. It shows CO2 emissions still rising, but temperatures have not been rising. If anything, they've been in a, either static or a moderate modest decline. Absolutely correct. What you look at if uh, the temperature record is that over a decadal period there are periods of warmer and cooler. But, and that's due to a change of the energy between the atmosphere and the ocean. It's a natural variability. But superimposed upon that, especially in the last 50 years, is a significant increase in temperature caused by greenhouse gases. So you, it's not at all surprising that in the last 10 years there's been a flattening. But the Still, models didn't show that. But the models would show it in the sense that if you look at a model and look at natural variables, there are periods where the, you get a flattening and an increase. And we have to remember, the last 10 years have still been the warmest temperatures on record. Every year since the year 2000 has been in the top 10 Does warm years. Does that take into account the heat island effect? Because oh, absolutely. Ma many of the ground temperatures uh, taken in America in the Midwest in the mid-30s show higher temperatures than now. Very good point. And in fact, when you take these temperature records, you do have to allow for the uh, e urban heat island effect. You also allow we don't have a perfect distribution of the thermometers around the world where the oceans are very underrepresented. So very good point. We have to take that into account. Yeah. The, we must be very careful about uh, s surface data. The satellite data that I'm more, mostly familiar with don't show what the surface data show. The surface data tend to be contaminated by urban heat island effect, as Bob Watson has mentioned, but also by poor placement of stations and many other problems. So what do the satellite data show that satellite is different? Satellite data show essentially, since 1979, mm. they show essentially no warming, no perceptible warming, then a sudden jump, and then in the last 10 years, a slight decline. And you don't think that's related the to CO2? The sudden jump doesn't, it doesn't but match. But wasn't that an El, an, an El Nino any, any climate model would say. 
There's no question. The satellite data has one advantage. It's a true global data set. It doesn't measure the surface temperature. It measures it in the lower atmosphere, which is still very important. And in reality, that surface data we've got is quite consistent with the satellite data. It does show a warming until about 10 years ago. And like the ground-based data, it tends to show a flattening. Absolutely consistent with what you would expect. Except, I repeat again, that none of the models told us there was going to be a 10-year flattening. None of the models in the mid-90s, on which the IPCC report is based, told us that there would be this flattening. But Indeed, Mr. Gore and the IPCC and all the rest showed us this hockey stick, which just showed a comp just a huge rise. But if you look at what the models show and they simulate the last 100 years, you actually see them sort of doing this sort of effect. So what we call the interdecadal variability is well understood, basically. So one of the key issues is understanding natural variability, but how human activities have superimposed a significant increase due to human activities. The models actually don't do that unless uh, you train them to do this. These are... Uh uh, variations that uh, my colleague here describes uh, were put in after the fact to explain why there was, for example, a cooling between 1940 and 1975. That's 30, when we were all worried about the Ice Age. 35 years of cooling. Mm -hmm. There were people worried about the coming Ice Age. Uh, I was not among those, but uh, many of my friends were. You weren't worried were. about the Ice Age or the warming, but <laughs> you're, well, you're a kind of temperate man, I think. <laughs> I'm a temperate, yes. yes. <laughs> Professor, I, I, let me ask you this, because you're associated with the University of East Anglia's um, uh, climate center, the, the CRU. What do you make of these emails that have suddenly come out that uh, have appeared, which the UEA tried to stop being published, in which one of your colleagues talks about using a trick to hide the decline? and then asks another of his colleagues to delete emails to Michael Mann, who is the great global warming uh, uh, supporter in the United States. First, I think we should have a public inquiry. You do. Both, effectively, it was an illegal act to hack, and that would say, why was it hacked, how was it hacked? And we should also have the inquiry to look at the data. I think there's no evidence any data has been destroyed. At the moment, all the data has not been issued to the world. You don't think these emails were deleted? I, the, I, I would like to see the public inquiry look into that very Why? carefully. Why? Can I just ask, because I'm slightly puzzled, since I, it's clear that national security is not at stake here, and that I suppose we, the British taxpayer, fund the University of East Anglia's climate work. Why wouldn't all this information, all of its data, be made public just as a matter of course. Very simple. The data is actually owned by the national meteorological services all around the world. And in fact, the universities ask all of these national services, can we allow their data to be given out yeah. to the world? So we've already asked for it under the Freedom of Information Act. And hopefully... But, but the, we'll UAE, be able to do the UEA it. was trying to avoid the Freedom of Information Act. Some of these exchanges said, don't tell them there's an FOI around. And, and you, your side of the argument, is asking us, the taxpayer across the globe, to make massive changes in our lifestyle ah. and yet massive changes in the way things are done. Now, you may be right, but surely you have an obligation to make all the data available. Agreed, and we need to make the data. But you but haven't. Because we haven't been allowed to because we don't own the data. It's owned by the national... But the point is independently. That sounds you, like a even if you put tap all, dancing But professor. even if you put all of that data aside, mm -hmm. we have two major data sets in the United States by NASA and NOAA. They analyze the same type of data sets, obviously, as University of East Anglia, and they get basically the same results. So you could throw all of the university data away and John, you'd still come with the same conclusion. John Cassidy, is the, this debate is also taking place in the United States, isn't it? it I mean, the, the, the global warming consensus is showing signs of cracking a bit at the, sea, at the edges? I would say there's, there's less questioning in the US. I mean it seems to me you know you've got model based data and regular data. What we saw in the financial crisis is you could never rely on the models. I'd mm. be more interested in the raw data than the... But we're the, not allowed to get to that yet. <laughs> well, that, Which that is a is journalist true. I think you would like to see. Uh, sure I obviously yeah. I would. You know. I, think I, I, sorry. I, think I should mention that we've set up an independent inquiry into how the data are used and what conclusions can be drawn and this is a group called the NIPCC which is completely independent of the IPCC and is not supported by governments. All right. It is a non-governmental group of scientists and our report says nature not human activity rules the climate. 